Hello there everyone, this is UXW Bill. To be completely honest with you, I really don't feel like making a video today, but it happens rather more often than I'd care to admit. I start out making a video with a part one, I say that part two is going to come along, and then for some reason or another, it just doesn't happen. So with this video, we're going to try to buck that trend. This is part two of the exciting story of the train gas furnace, gas pressure, gas valves, the gas company, the whole nine yards. And it starts with UXW Bill having a healthy serving of what they refer to as humble pie. You might have also heard it referred to as eating crow. No matter what you want to say, I've definitely been doing it here. I was wrong about the inlet gas pressure. Anywhere I'd been previously, chalk it up to a lack of experience because, again, I'm just starting out in this field and there's a lot that I don't know. And the few jobs that I held down for a short time in this particular arena Nobody ever really worked with me to mentor me, to help me to understand things better, to know the ropes a little bit better in this business. And so naturally, I'm making about every mistake there is in the book. But to air is human, right? <laughs> the, ca the gas company says that the pressure around here is normal at between 6 and 8 inches water column. And indeed, the data plate on the furnace says that it needs a minimum of 5 to function. So that was... That was never an issue to start with. I probably sent them out here completely unnecessarily, even though they did say that the regulator and the meter were both quite old, should be replaced. What's done has been done. All we can do now is go forward. So let's go down there and start getting that gas valve out of that furnace. I'll also demonstrate to you that it is in fact getting power and should open when commanded to do so. Of course, with a bit of a nod to safety, since we're going to have the gas line open, and they gave me this really nice serviceman friendly shut off we might as well go ahead and use that before we get started and there it is and just a quick oh by the way while we happen to be here on older gas meters there tends to be just this one shut off valve and although I've certainly seen people do this and I've been guilty of doing it myself that particular gas valve on the inlet side of the meter is for the gas company personnel to operate only on these newer installations, they're putting this second valve in place that is intended for service technicians and mere mortals to work with. Okay, there's the gas valve disconnected from electricity, at least partially, so I can hook up my meter. I'm going to go ahead and turn the switch on the side of the furnace on, then we'll push in the door switch. And you can all watch. Doesn't that motor just sound lovely when it starts? Sounds like there's a lot of run out in those bearings. <laughs> anyway, it's doing the pre-purge right now, and then the control board will send the signal, close the relay that energizes the gas valve, and you'll see there'll be about 28 volts AC that appears on the meter's display here momentarily. There it is. You probably heard the relay click. If I was to hold in the door switch long enough, you'd see that it just tried and failed to get things kicked off. So let's go ahead and get that crazy thing out of there. How much you want to bet that union will actually come apart? <laughs> All right, the union came undone. That didn't involve too much of a struggle, but getting this pipe going off to these burners, getting the gas valve to come off of there has proven to be exceedingly frustrating. Whatever sort of material they use to put that thing in there must be the same stuff they stuck the tiles to the space shuttle with. <laughs> And I'm afraid if I try and keep it up down here, I'm just going to ruin something. Now, if that something happened to be the gas valve, I really don't care about that. But I really don't want to ruin this tube going off to these burners. And if we look in here, it looks to me like somebody's replaced the igniter at some point. It's definitely not what would appear to be the stock arrangement of the wiring as far as I'm concerned. Doesn't look like it takes too much to get that out of there, though. So, cut the zip tie, undo these bolts. And we'll take this thing out and see if I can work on it a little more effectively in, in broad daylight and with more room than I've got down here and maybe another tool or two. I don't know if I ought to shut that in the vise and try horsing on it that way. That really does not want to come undone. And Like I say, I was putting enough force on that thing. I was beginning to think I was going to kink or break or rupture it in some manner. And why, then we would have a problem, wouldn't we? don't want to do that to the customer's equipment. Now that thing really made me work for it, but I've gotten everything out of here undamaged. We have the orifice tube right here. 
little pipe nipple with the other half of the union. Stop giggling, that's really what they're called. <laughs> the bench vise over at the shop. <laughs> no, I wouldn't call it my garage, it's, just, it's the shop now. <laughs> It almost wasn't up to the challenge, or rather the workbench to which it's mounted almost wasn't up to the challenge. It almost pulled out of the wood to which it was mounted, so I guess that's going to have to be reinvestigated at some point. But here we are. We're just about ready to put the old gas valve right back in and install it backwards for extra credit. <laughs> you know, they say that if you work really hard for something, you appreciate it just that much more. I think about it totally differently, and when I start working too hard on something, I'm like, let's see if I can find a lackey like, say, the keykeeper to finish the job for me. <laughs> but we're just about ready to go ahead and clean up the threads on these pipes, and then we'll go ahead and put some fresh pipe dope on there to try and make sure nothing leaks. You know, I'll grab the other end of the pipe here, and then it'll be like, hoo, hoo, hoo. there's a dope at both ends of the pipe. <laughs> I can see some of you out there in the comments section saying this is short bus heating and air repair. <laughs> and I, I'm not going to deny that I will make some mistakes and do imperfect things, but you know, if I learn something from it, that's ultimately what counts. And I probably shouldn't come down that hard on the short bus because when I was in kindergarten, a class of about 10 students, and we of course rode a short bus back in the mid 1980s. That was a pretty cool bus, really. It, it set my expectations far too high for the state of school buses. It was a Dodge chassis, just a van. I don't remember whose bus body was on it, but I do remember it was air-conditioned and it had an AM-FM radio. And for many years after that, when I finally graduated up to riding on full-size buses, as my class grew, they were such a letdown because for many years they didn't have a radio and they were never air-conditioned. In fact, school was not air-conditioned until my senior year. My, how things have changed. These days, a school without air conditioning, that's, that's a rarity. But we're getting way off the subject here. Let's go ahead and clean these things up with our wire brush and start putting things back together. We'll put the old gas valve back in and assemble everything backwards. I'm sure it'll work really, really well. And there it is, all put together. No doubt the fit and finish will need a little fine-tuning when I get it down back to the furnace. But that's the next step. Go ahead and put it in. And we'll test for leaks and see where we happen to be. And here's everything back together. I've gone ahead and turned on the gas outside. And I've also turned on the gas valve down here. That was a couple minutes ago. I've sniffed around for any gas leaks. I don't smell anything. I think we should be in pretty good shape, ready to go. I will do a more comprehensive leak check. We'll get some soapy bubbles and my fancy electronic leak detector down here and see if I find anything. But Why don't we just go ahead and fire this thing up, hopefully not too literally, and just see if it happens to take off and ignite the way that it's supposed to. It may take more than one trial, depending upon how much air got in the gas line. Don't stand in front of one of these things when you're doing this, in case there is a problem. I heard ignition! That makes kind of a cool noise. <laughs> well, I'd say, at least preliminarily speaking, it is back in the land of the living with a new gas valve. Like I say, I'll go ahead and leave the gas turned on and I'll come back down here with some soapy bubbles and the electronic leak detector and just make sure of what we find before we go ahead and let this thing run for real and see if anything like the heat exchanger happens to have been hurt. It's been about a half an hour. Let's go see what we've got. Nothing so far, which is a good sign.
Might be a little something there, I'm not sure. I'll have to get the soapy bubbles and see. Yeah, it's registering something around that union. So I'll have to check that out. Well, I went and looked around with the soapy bubbles, and I sure couldn't find it there. But this detector was insistent that something was going on around the bottom of that union. So I went ahead and tightened everything up. I turned the gas back on now. It's been about five minutes. And it seems like we're probably okay now. So we'll just have to keep an eye on it. I also have to do a pressure test on this thing's outlet. They say in the manual it's preset, but I just want to verify that. Oh, I just leaned on my keyless entry remote. That was clever. So now that I think we're probably good on the inlet side of things, let's go ahead and see what's going on on the outlet. The thermostat is calling for heat upstairs. So we'll just see what we get here. I am far from an expert in diagnosing heat exchanger failures and I think the most conclusive test is to actually pull the heat exchanger and look but a lot of times you can tell from the condition of the flames on those in-shot burners what's going on and of course if it's really bad you'll know this is the first time this thing is really heated and I don't even know how long so we'll see Boy, that thing really sounds terrible. Doesn't really sound like it's maintaining speed all that well either. There goes our fan. When you're looking for any change in the characteristics of the flames, oh yeah, smell that burning. <laughs> wow, that really stinks. <laughs> I didn't see any. Of course, you're kind of limited what you can see through that viewport any flare-ups of orange or anything like that that would suggest you got air leaking in your heat exchanger or combustion products leaking out of your heat exchanger I should say and a couple of carbon monoxide detectors upstairs to see if they say anything I presume they probably work and we'll just check again here and see if we're registering anything on our gas leak tester here These are the inlet and outlet pipes for the combustion air and the byproducts. The outlet's right up against that bulkhead door. It's not the best situation. Probably not a huge problem though, given that that's not going to be open a whole lot. And there's this stupid tree here in front of the inlet. It is getting to be insanely hot in here. I actually have a better carbon monoxide detector, but I haven't used it in forever and I have no idea where it is. So I simply took this one and put it over the vent and figured that if we had a big enough problem, it would probably bleat in pain soon enough and let us know. But I think we just might be okay here. And boy howdy, this thing is really belting out the heat. Just as an added safety benefit, I'm going to go ahead and throw one of these down here. My heating and air conditioning instructor was always very big on the idea that if you weren't sure whether or not a customer had one of these carbon monoxide and poison gas detectors in their home or if it even worked, 
you can just throw one in. Just leave it there. It'll foster goodwill, shows the customer you really care about them, and heaven forbid if anything goes wrong, it'll be there to warn them in the future. So now that we've got the backup battery installed, we'll just go over here to this outlet and pop that right in there. We'll go back here and turn this light off. And we'll get ready to wrap everything up. As always, thank you for watching, and certainly do feel free to leave a constructive comment if you happen to have one.